Tijuana. And the federal government says they could grow to a mass of 10,000 or more. A representative of the group Angels Without Borders say the migrants are considering something truly unbelievable, a human stampede across the southern border of the United States. Meanwhile, a new Gallup poll shows that the percentage of Americans who view immigration as the country's top issue is surging rapidly. 21% of Americans say immigration is the top issue, compared to 13% just a month ago. Chris Kobach is Secretary of State for Kansas. He joins us now. Chris, um, what exactly is the difference between uh, what they're planning, which is this human stampede, and uh, what we used to call in the old days an invasion? <laughs> there, there's not a whole heck of a lot of difference. Uh, it is a massive influx of people. And uh, Mark, one of the things that I think we need to consider right now is something that Congress wisely put in federal law back in 1996. It's not too often you use the word wisely when talking mm -hmm. about Congress, but they actually planned ahead. And they said in federal statute, if ever there is a mass influx of aliens at our border, the president has the authority, the secretary of Homeland Security has the authority to call up state and local police to help repel this invasion or this influx. Uh, and right now that's necessary because ICE agents and Border Patrol agents whom I've spoken to say they are overwhelmed. They don't have the manpower right now and they need it and they need it quick. And, and you make the point that that doesn't just mean that they can deputize uh, local police departments in Southern California whose political bosses may not be keen on uh, them enforcing right. federal immigration law, but that in theory uh, he can, uh, uh, the president actually has the authority to deputize sheriff's deputies from Maine and New Hampshire to act on the southern border. That's exactly right. And, uh, and this ties in with your point you made in the introduction, Mark. Uh, it is an issue of very high concern, the top issue for so many Americans. I guarantee that if President Trump made a nas national appeal to sheriff's departments across the country to say, can you come help us? We need the manpower. We'll reimburse your deputies for their time. Can you help us to repel this mass influx of people who are planning to rush our border? I, I guarantee that there would be hundreds of deputies, hundreds of sheriff's departments saying, yes, we will help. So I think the time is now to use this power that has been given to the executive branch. Now, uh, this is Thanksgiving, Chris, and we live in a very weird time because we're told the country's on orange alert. Uh, so it takes you hours if you're just flying home to see your grandmother to get through the airport. Uh, the uh, yeah. Transport Security Administration has rules on the density of your pumpkin pie uh, because if it's too moist, <laughs> it counts as a liquid, so it has to be part of your checked baggage. That's what lawful... Americans uh, who are residing in this country entirely legally have to put up with. But at the same time as they're on orange alert, uh, people can apparently just walk across the border with impunity. Um, at some point, yeah. uh, the public will get sick of the obvious contradiction in that, won't they? You know, Mark, I think they're already sick of the contradiction, and you put it very well. And this, this group of migrants at the southern border in the Tijuana area right now, they are, by all accounts, just a general mix of illegal aliens. They're not a mass of people who are fleeing oppression, and right. they are particular candidates for asylum. Uh, th they're going to rapidly find out that this, these, the waiting for the asylum at adjudication is going to be a wait in vain. The vast majority, maybe 90 percent, will be denied. And at some point, word will get out among these migrants, hey, you know what, we're not going to get asylum. Maybe we'll just do what we were planning on anyway, and that is either sneaking across the border or rushing the border. And that's where we need more manpower, because they are undermanned right now on our side of the border. The other point you make, which is a great... Everyone uses these uh, cliches, we need comprehensive immigration reform. There are actually more immigration laws than any functioning society would need. There's actually more immigration <laughs> law than immigration officers at border posts can understand. They know very little of it themselves because it's too, uh, there's too much of it. It's the fact that there's not the political will to enforce the, the immigration laws that's the issue. Yes, that's it. We often hear this cop out. Oh, our immigration laws are broken. No, they're not broken. If you actually read them, Congress, over the many decades that we've had these laws, has inserted a lot of really good provisions in there that if we have the will to actually use them, we could reinforce our rule of law in this country.
That's a, that's a good point, uh, Chris. Happy Thanksgiving to you, Chris Kobach. Thank you very much. You, uh, you too. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. President Trump is uh, in a spat with the Chief Justice uh, of the Supreme Court today. Yesterday, the president blasted the perceived political motivations of a federal judge who blocked new rules on asylum seekers from being implemented. This was an Obama judge. And I'll tell you what, it's not going to happen like this anymore. Well, the president's remarks provoked a surprise rebuke from Chief Justice John Roberts, who said in a statement, quote, we do not have Obama judges or Trump judges, Bush judges or Clinton judges. What we have is an extraordinary group of dedicated judges doing their level best to do equal right to those appearing before them. That independent judiciary is something we should all be thankful for. The president hit back on Twitter this afternoon saying, quote, sorry, Chief Justice John Roberts, but you do indeed have Obama judges. And they have a much different point of view than the people who are charged with the safety of our country. It would be great if the Ninth Circuit was indeed an independent judiciary. But if it is, why are so many opposing views on border and safety cases filed there? And why are a vast number of those cases overturned? Please study the numbers. They're shocking. We need protection and security. These rulings are making our country unsafe, very dangerous and unwise. Jonathan Turley is a professor at George Washington University Law School. Uh, he joins us. Pro professor, uh, to take uh, the Chief Justice's uh, point at, at face value, if you did want to make a point uh, that just judges are above politics, uh, why would uh, the nation's chief judge essentially intervene uh, in a, a provocative political manner in the way that John Roberts has? Well, Mark, in fairness to the Chief Justice, this is a very uncommon thing for him to do. It's virtually unheard of in modern times. Uh, he has basically held his tongue for two years, uh, but he is the senior, you know, member of the judiciary. And I felt that great sympathy towards him when he reacted uh, today the way he did. I mean, he feels that his mandate is to stand up for the judiciary. Um, I don't think that the president was fair about the, this criticism. Mm. The decision that, that he was referencing would have come out the same way, in my view, for both Republican and Democratic nominees. John Roberts himself voted to, to preserve the individual mandate of Obamacare. I disagreed with his decision there. I thought that the reasoning was wrong. Mm. But I also understood that he was following what he thought was the dictates of the law, not the person who nominated him. Now, where I, where I probably would criticize the Chief Justice a little bit is that I wish that he was more active in policing the court itself. You know, uh, Justice Ginsburg, the late Justice uh, Scalia, both were criticized for political or unwise right. statements made in commentary, and the Chief Justice has not been that proactive. But isn't the president uh, making slightly a more of a basic point here, which is that uh, you have Democrats and Republicans and they slog it out at election time and one or other party wins. And we're increasingly uh, at a time now where instead, whoever wins, we have government by judges in which judges uh, essentially are micro-legislating uh, aspects of particular policies in a way that would have been unrecognizable uh, to uh, judges and politicians uh, of the late 18th century. Well, you know, Mark, I, I've criticized the Ninth Circuit for some of the decisions that they have handed down against the administration. But I've never questioned the motivations of those judges. Now, in fairness to President Trump, there is a difference in philosophy between a Trump uh, appointee and probably an Obama mm -hmm. appointee. They will, at some points, disagree on, on a philosophical basis how to view the Constitution. In the vast majority of cases, there isn't that much disagreement. Most cases are unanimous, even despite who people were appointed. I think that what Chief Justice Roberts was trying to say is that it's unfair to this judiciary and we're very we are blessed with a wonderful judiciary because people really do try to get things right. right these are decent people trying to come to the right decision people like me disagree with them on the sidelines but i don't think that it's because of ideology it is because of their philosophical view of how to interpret the constitution 
Well, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll take that up about the blessings of the judiciary at another time. <laughs> thank, thank you, Professor, and a happy thank Thanksgiving you, to you. you uh, the, uh, the Democrats say Ivanka Trump's private email use is no different from Hillary Clinton's. But does that comparison hold up? That's coming up next. Plus, they want to equate Ivanka to Hillary Clinton and her private server, but the president says there's no comparison. Ivanka can handle herself. These are all in the historical records. There was no deletion whatsoever, unlike Hillary Clinton, who deleted 33,000 emails. Unlike Hillary Clinton, who had a server in the basement, Ivanka didn't. This was just early on when she came in. These calls were not classified, unlike Hillary Clinton's calls, which were classified. And it's all fake news. That was the president before his Thanksgiving break. Brian Dean Wright is a Democrat and former CIA officer. Uh, Brian, uh, we have courthouses legislating and we have legislators uh, holding trials. Is this the best use of Congress? Oh, we've got two years of this, brother. Uh, I hope we're all ready. Uh, the, the short answer is no. Look, there is a small degree of oversight that, that is critical that both the Senate and the House uh, do. So whether it's looking into the uh, uh, Hillary Clinton Foundation, the bill in the Hillary Clinton Foundation, all those shenanigans, let the Department of Justice wrap that up. You know, on the Ivanka side, let's make sure she didn't send any classified. But at the end of the day, you know, how many people really care uh, about Ivanka's emails, absent classified information? Not many. In fact, I'm going to go ahead and say not. Uh, you know, I'm in northern uh, Indiana, and I can guarantee you that the people uh, in, in Fort Wayne, uh, places like Huntington, aren't concerned uh, with Ivanka's emails. It's just not the right way uh, to govern because they're not interested in all that silliness. What do they want? They want the Congress to focus on the stuff uh, that they're supposed to focus on. Jobs, health care. Those are the things that America cares about. You're, you're uh, not going to get anywhere on that, though, are you? Because uh, basically uh, the energy in the new Democrat Congress is for... Well, for a start, there's a lot of people who want to impeach the president. Uh, and if they can't impeach the president, they'd at least like to ensnare those around him, such as members of his family, in tedious investigations for a couple of years. Sure. Look, we, we've seen this, right? For the past 20 plus years, what, what really, what has America experienced? Mm -hmm. One side uh, trying to mess over the other with the hope that they can gain even greater power in the next election. And I think what you have seen certainly in 2016 and a degree here in the last few weeks is people walking in uh, to the, the, the voting booth uh, and using their middle finger to vote and mm -hmm. saying, enough, uh, let's get back to the business of governing. And I think most people are so frustrated by the back and forth uh, of not solving problems. Again, Huntington, I'll, I'll give you a great example. The, the, the carrier uh, company shut down and has laid off a whole bunch of folks. Uh, are they caring about Ivanka's emails? No, they're not. They want good jobs. They want to solve this, this global trade issue where everything gets shipped off to, to Mexico or to China. Right. That's the stuff that people care about, good health care. So if people don't get the results they want, either from this last election when Democrats won uh, or, or President Trump and his uh, promises in 2016, parties are going to pay for it. Somebody's going to have to pay for it. And, and you watch, they will. Is there a serious uh, structural problem here in that... Uh, uh, to, to the Democrats particularly, but you could make uh, you can make points about both sides on this. Uh, in effect, the criminalization of politics, so that if you have a particular mm. approach to immigration or health care or whatever it is, uh, it's uh, it's not just that you have a public policy difference. It's that in some sense uh, you're a criminal and you have to be investigated. Right. Well, when you see the other side as evil. That's when you start getting this investigative junk. Uh, and so we have to change that with our own hearts. And definitely when we go to uh, the, the, the voting booths, we have to forward uh, prospects of, of folks in the political system who are more interested in solving problems and not seeing the other side as evil. I mean, that's really what it comes down to. OK, Brian, we'll, uh, we'll wait and see whether they take you at your word for that. Thanks uh, for that and have a good uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, the press uh, says life, life, that life. election fraud never happens, uh, but the facts keep contradicting them. Prosecutors in Los Angeles have charged nine people for a scheme where they allegedly bribed homeless people with cash and cigarettes in return for forging signatures on voter registration forms and ballot measure petitions. Uh, Harmi Dillon is a board member of the Republican National Lawyers Association. Uh, she joins us. Harmi, this is, this is the fraud that Democrats assure us 
doesn't exist. And yet... That's here it comes again. That's right, Mark. This is the tip of the iceberg. In fact, these people who were arrested are part of a ring of people who are doing this over the last two election mm -hmm. cycles. And it's a particularly cynical ploy. The uh, signature gatherers, who are the people here in this case, they can get up to $12 a signature for signatures on petitions, which is what was happening here. Mm -hmm. And yet they're paying these uh, poor bums on Skid Row uh, a buck or a cigarette yeah. in order to get them to forge signatures. So if you see this arrest happening in L.A. County, a liberal county, you know for sure that it's happening all over the state of California. And it's just one of many examples I could give you of voter fraud happening in California. Well, there are some amazing examples. 75 people registered to vote at a non-existent address in Malibu. 31 people registered to vote at a check cashing store in Southside LA. Uh, 10 people registered to vote at a miniature a mini golf course. And say, actually, I'm in favor of the mini golf course. I think every, every, every bit to vote, you have to actually be living at a miniature golf course in San Diego. Uh, Maybe they're miniature people. I don't know. That's uh, right. <laughs> miniature voters in mini, miniature <laughs> polling booths with miniature dangling chads and uh, dimpled chads and all the rest of it. What's, yes. what's the big what's the big picture here that, that we we have a bad, you know, we're getting a reputation for Jimmy Carter and the UN observers having to come in and supervise these elections. What's the, what's the systemic corruption? Where's that come from? Well, let me give you one more figure in addition to the ones that you mentioned. In the year 2016 to 2017 in California, almost half a million people called for jury duty said they were not United States citizens. And now that's very telling mm -hmm. because the jury, because those, those roles come from the voter registration. So you're talking about massive fraud here. And frankly, uh, a combination of Democratic secretaries of state who have no interest in purging the roles contribute to this, like in California. Uh, in some states like Georgia, you have uh, secretaries of state who are following the law and purging mm -hmm. the roles. And so you have better outcomes there, uh, despite what what the gubernatorial candidate there said. And so what Republicans need to do in the next election cycle is really be vigilant about this issue. And all Americans should be vigilant because in any state, people voting who don't have a right to, or people signing papers who don't have a right to, dilute the vote of every citizen, which is a very fundamental right to us in our country. I'm an immigrant uh, myself, Mark, and mm. to me, this is one of the most precious rights of our democracy. So we need to safeguard it better than we do. But you use the word vigilance. Uh, when, when people try to exercise vigilance at polling stations, and in elections, the Democrats say they're racist and they're trying to suppress the vote. So You're that vigilance right. is racism, according to them. Right. I mean, in fact, when we've tried to do uh, voter integrity efforts in the Republican Party, we've actually been sued by the Democrats and put on the sidelines for several years at the RNC. So that's definitely a significant issue. But we have a Department of Justice right now, and we do control the executive branch. And the Department of Justice has an election division, and they should actually be taking a look at this issue and bringing some federal indictments. Because like I said, Skid Row, this is just one incident. Yeah. And if you scratch the surface, you're going to find a lot more. And it's, it's huge. Selling the votes of the homeless for 12 bucks a pop and in return giving them a free smoke. Uh, wonderful, yep. wonderful situation. Uh, Harmi, Very thank nice. you and uh, have a great Thanksgiving as one thank immigrant you. to uh, a, another. Uh, President Trump is keeping Saudi Arabia as a US ally despite the murder that took place in a consulate in Turkey. Is that the right move for America? That's ahead. Plus, an American murdered with bows and arrows on a remote island. An American missionary has been killed while trying to contact an isolated tribe uh, in the Indian Ocean, in the Bay of Bengal. Ed Henry joins us with more details. Ed? Yeah, it's really a remarkable story. It's playing out on North Sentinel Island in the Bay of Bengal, about the size of Manhattan, home to the Sentinelese tribe, which is small, about a dozen people, but they're fierce and resist any contact at all with the outside world. Now, local media reports have identified this American as John Allen Chow. We're told he went to India on a tourist visa, and last week he paid several local fishermen to take him to this area that is part of the extremely remote Andaman Island archipelago. Once he got close to the island, he hopped into a kayak and moved closer to shore. Now, the fishermen told Indian police later that Chow was met by several members of this tribe. He offered them gifts, including a football, but then was shot at with bows and arrows by this group described online as the most dangerous tribe in the world. He escaped the first time, swam back to the fishermen, but Chow apparently returned the next day, and the fishermen later saw the tribesmen 
dragging his body along the beach. Now, officials from India check on the locals from time to time, usually with a military helicopter. For example, that happened, as you see here, after the Indian Ocean tsunami in 04. Even then, members of the tribe reportedly fired arrows at the helicopter when they thought it got too close to them. Tonight, the State Department has not yet officially confirmed the death of John Chow. He's been reported as being either 26 or 27. They're simply saying they're aware of these reports and are working with local authorities to try to get to the bottom of it. But it's interesting, these local people are protected under Indian law, and um, basically any contact with them is considered illegal because of the risk of disease. So getting justice for this American's death could get very complicated from a diplomatic standpoint, Mark. Yeah, these are basically uh, the least uh, open borders society uh, on Earth. They, yeah, uh, they seriously... Uh, uh, protect their, uh, their territorial frontiers. Uh, North uh, Sentinel Island uh, in the Andaman Islands chain. Ed, uh, thanks. Good to see you. Uh, despite Saudi Arabia's... Ed is going to be back later, by the way. You won't want to miss that. <laughs> despite uh, Saudi Arabia's murder of uh, Jamal Khashoggi, uh, President Trump says he won't be turning against the country. Yesterday, the president was blunt about his reasoning. Being friendly with the Saudis is in the interests of the U.S. economy. I'm not going to tell a country that's spending hundreds of billions of dollars and has helped me do one thing very importantly, keep oil prices down so that they're not going to 100 and $150 a barrel. Right now, we have oil prices in great shape. I'm not going to destroy the world economy, and I'm not going to destroy the economy for our country by being foolish with Saudi Arabia. The president continued down that path today, tweeting, quote, oil price is getting lower. Great. Like a big tax cut for America and the world. Enjoy. $54 was just $82. Thank you to Saudi Arabia, but let's go lower. Uh, Nigel Farage is a former leader of the UK Independence Party and the driving force behind Brexit. Uh, he joins us from London. Nigel, uh, the Saudis, uh, uh, even though the highest level of leadership in the country was implicated in this murder, appear to have gotten away with it as far as the world is concerned. Yeah, that's right. I mean, look, I do understand that for both the USA and the UK, Saudi Arabia is a very important market to us. Hundreds of thousands of jobs linked uh, with selling aeroplanes and munitions. Uh, I also get the strategic alliance with Saudi Arabia against Iran, uh, you know, who've been trying to spread a very extreme form uh, of Islamism right across the region. So I understand the reasons for it. But imagine if any other country had behaved like this. Imagine if Russia had behaved like this. There'd be a much bigger international outcry. And my real problem, Mark, is that in the wake of the Syrian crisis, Saudi, Saudi Arabia did not take a single refugee mm. or displaced person but we're happy to fund the building of 200 mosques in Germany. And right. what we have seen, what we have seen is Wahhabism being spread using Saudi money. So, fine, let's go on doing trade. Let's go on having strategic alliances. But let's not be frightened to be critical of some of the things that Saudi Arabia does. Yeah, Saudi Arabia's principal export isn't oil. It's actually ideology, and the oil just enables them to spread that ideology around the world. But basically, 15 Saudis uh, killed 3,000 Americans on 9-11. Nothing yeah. really... Ha well, President Bush assured us the Saudis are our friends. We now have a crown prince who uh, Senator Lindsey Graham and others say is patently unstable. Uh, unlike in your own uh, royal house, uh, you're just a couple of miles from uh, the Court of St. James's. They don't have uh, strict primogeniture in the House of Saud. So why couldn't we at least put pressure on Saudi Arabia to remove this guy as crown prince and have someone else as crown prince? Well, yes, I mean, you know, MBS, as he's known, mm. was sold to us as being this great reformer. Mm. Uh, the truth is, uh, that would appear not to be the case at all. Uh, and one of the things that he does appear to have done is to pursue the very unpleasant war that is going on in Yemen. And maybe for a moment we should think uh, that some of the bombs uh, that we're sending to Saudi Arabia are actually being used by him in this war. So you're quite right. There are many other options for who effectively can be the head of Saudi Arabia. You know, I understand what Trump's saying. I understand uh, in this country Mrs May's uh, reluctance to be too critical, but we should 
be saying and doing more. And, and we should also be clear, too, that uh, Khashoggi is being presented as a sort of hero of journalism. He's probably going to be Time magazine's man of the year uh, just because he is a dead so-called journalist. But in fact, he was kind of a deep state Saudi spook uh, who just happened to fall out with the royal family. In a sense, uh, it's, it's, it's different sets of bad guys we're arguing about when well, we talk of course about Saudi is. Arabia. Of course it is. But don't you think actually the truth is all through the Middle East, mm. uh, whether we look at Iraq or Libya or Syria, we keep on playing this game yeah. of saying who are the good guys and who are the bad guys. And more often than not, we tend to get it wrong. <laughs> it's, uh, it's the old CIA line. Uh, he may be an uh, SOB, but he's our SOB. Yeah, exactly. uh, it's actually, the truth is the other. He may be our SOB, but he's still an SOB. Uh, Nigel, <laughs> thank you and happy thank Thanksgiving. You. I know they don't have I it do. over there, but... The power of big tech is not typically considered a laughing matter. A handful of big companies have destroyed a lot of people's privacy, threatened free speech, and in some cases empowered China at the expense of the United States. But even if Silicon Valley's power is a serious issue, perhaps getting the public to think about it in a more critical and amusing way might awaken them to the threat. Jessica Powell is a former head of communications for Google. She wrote the book, The Big Disruption. It's a novel. It satirizes Silicon Valley. She joins us tonight. Jessica Powell, thanks very much for coming on. Thanks for having me. There are not many satires about Silicon Valley. It seems like the most self-serious place maybe on the planet. <laughs> we take ourselves very seriously. Yes, because you're saving the world, right? It's not, Constantly. you're not just selling products. You're like We're saving the world. improving human nature itself. Every moment of the day. Do they believe that? I mean, I think to a certain degree they really do. And I, and I do think there have been some incredible things that yes. Silicon Valley has built. Well, I agree. Right? Um, but I also think there's a certain level of hypocrisy in that we go out saying that we're doing all these wonderful things and we don't always think ahead about the potential, you know, the unintended consequences of what we build. I wonder if, like, Edsel Ford ever thought that. Like, I've got a new car, but this is, it's more like a religious movement than a car. I mean, this is actually kind of like the, this new vehicle will will give you eternal life. Like, I don't think they ever convince themselves of that in other industries. Yeah, and you know, I, I was really interested in writing the book because I feel like on the one hand, when you're in these companies, there's a lot of kind of almost Kool-Aid drinking and sort of delusional, yes. we're wonderful, we're wonderful. And then on the outside, you have a really, really critical tech stealing all our jobs, tech ste you know, stealing all of our data. And I think the truth is somewhere in between the two. And so I wanted to do something as someone who's part of the industry and likes the industry, but thinks we can do better, I wanted to do something that people could actually connect with rather than just write off as, oh, the Luddites are criticizing right, us again. Right, right. No, and is that their view? I think there is generally a view that when people, particularly people who aren't engineers or who don't understand technology, when they come in criticizing you, they're just not sufficiently living in the future, thinking far enough ahead, you know? <laughs> we used to call that hubris. I don't know what we call it now. Um, Innovation. <laughs> Innovation. So what, because... I was about to say there are so few novels in this genre, I think you may be the only occupant of this genre. What's been, and you had a real job, I mean, you were the chief spokesman for Google, so what's the response been like to you? I mean, I've had a lot of really positive emails from people within Google and from across the industry. The typical email tends to go, I'm laughing a lot, I'm cringing a lot, and I've been told there's a lot of conversations happening in the micro kitchens. Well, God bless you for starting those conversations. I always wonder as I watch these companies grow ever larger, if anyone within them thinks what people used to think, which is concentrations of power at this level are inherently dangerous to everybody, you shouldn't have this small a number of people with this much power, they're going to misuse it. Do they think that? You know, I, I think on some level they understand that. Um, but I, I do think that on the whole, because everyone thinks that they're doing such good work, they think that the, whether it's the means justify the ends or they, they constantly are looking at what they're building and not looking at some of the negative consequences. I think one of the other real problems is that there's such a monoculture of thought yes. and such a focus on data all the time that if, for example, you have two billion users and let's say a couple bad things happen, I don't know, some live stream suicide, some electoral interference, whatever it might be, you say, oh, that's a small percentage of our two billion users. Well, a small percentage, say 0.1 percent, 0.01 percent of two billion, that's a lot of electoral <laughs> interference. That's a lot of ethnic <laughs> cleansing in Myanmar, right? Point. So I guess that raised my last question, which is the most obvious of all, and you could answer this as a novelist, should engineers be in charge of our society? I, I love engineers. I think engineers are incredible, and I think some of the stuff coming out of the valley is incredible. But I think you need more people at the table. I think you need more people that represent the outside world and not just a whole bunch of people that live in one geographic part of the world making decisions that affect everyone else. I hope they take your criticism seriously, because it's obviously meant in good faith and 
formulated with deep knowledge of the topic. And so I hope they listen to you. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thanks. Live stream suicides are a small percentage of our users. That's a great sentence. Last week's news. Fox chief national correspondent Ed Henry is this week's defending champion. We're running out of sacrificial <laughs> victims to toss into the great churning volcano of his ambition. <laughs> but we have managed to produce Tammy Bruce. Yes, I'm ready. Uh, and if, if Tammy loses tonight, uh, the penalty will be that she has to uh, guest host Friday's show. She doesn't want to do that. I, I will take she, that. She doesn't, she, she's terrified of having to do it. She doesn't want to do that. Okay, no, she has done nothing but intimidate me since I sat down. She's I am ready all for these Friday already. I'm ready. Yeah. I'm okay. Ready well, she said she's going to make quick work of me. She yeah. said, I use this hand because I, I fired my gun with this hand. So right. she's got me nervous. I'm ambidextrous. <laughs> this, is, this is the aggressive hand. I'm ready. Okay. Aggressive hands on buzzers. I'm going to ask the questions. The first one to buzz in uh, gets to answer, but you must wait until I finish asking the question. You can answer once I acknowledge you by saying your name. Oh. <laughs> it's very particular now. This is all the international uh, quiz show convention uh, in Geneva. This is all entirely compatible Geneva. with Geneva. Each correct answer is worth one point. You get it wrong, you lose a point, and the best of five wins. Let's get started. Question one. In honour of Thanksgiving, President Trump yesterday continued the tradition of the turkey pardon. The birds this year are both named after vegetables. One turkey is named Peas. What is the name of the other bird? And, yes! Uh, it's... Whoa, that's too aggressive. Uh, Tabby... I'm Italian and Scottish. <laughs> okay. Carrots. Uh, let us see whether that is right. Is the other turkey called Even Carrots? Peas and Carrots have received <laughs> a presidential pardon. I have warned them that House Democrats are likely to issue them both subpoenas. Yeah, I think I think he should have rechristened them Manafort and Papadopoulos and then, uh, and then pardoned them. It's one point to Tammy as I we go you, into round two. I, I think I broke my... Buzz. Yeah, Ed, it Good. was worth it, Tammy. Ed, Ed, win. Look never, at you, double-fisted right there. Never had an opening like this. Ed is facing total humiliation. <laughs> uh, Tuesday marked the opening of the first legal marijuana shop on the East Coast, the dispensary is located in which northeastern state? Ed Henry. Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Let's see the first uh, marijuana dispensary on the East Coast. Roll tape. Massachusetts oh, is the seventh state to open retail marijuana okay, shops, right. but the first to open them east of the you Mississippi. Yeah. Retail I get, I get shops can sell each customer no more than an ounce of flour <laughs> or 20 servings of edibles. Yes, so Tammy's an expert in uh, carrots, and Ed <laughs> is an expert on reefer madness. <laughs> I just moved to Boston. You, you can tell from there his eyes. Uh, so it's one point each. Question three is a multiple choice one. In a viral video going around this week, a Russian lady was spotted at a Moscow train station with a very unusual pet sitting on her shoulder. Was it A, a koala, B, a fox, or C, a sloth? Oh, no. Ed Henry. Fox. A fox on the shoulder of a Russian lady. Roll tape. Moving to Russia. We have a Fox News in Russia. Now check this out. A Russian woman with a pet fox nonchalantly go. perched well, on her you. shoulder. We've got raised a, a couple of eyebrows, show, yeah, but said. not many because it is Moscow. There you go. They usually have a lot of fur on. Yeah. I, I like lie. a woman with real fur on her yes, shoulder. Exactly. That's, uh, that's nice. I told her uh, before the show that one more thing, there's yes. always an answer. That's yes, one sir. coat, though, you have to feed, unfortunately. Yeah, that's, that's right. You've got to have that in your other pocket. Question four. NASA has announced that after a six-month journey, its spacecraft will finally land next week and explore the surface of which planet? Tammy. Mars. Is it Mars? Let's see. 
NASA's latest visitor to Mars is just about yes, there. The InSight probe We're doing it. arrives We're doing it Monday again. after a six-month, 300 million We've mile go back journey. To the moon, though. <laughs> I want to go back to the moon, man, before the Chinese well, don't get worry, there. We're going to send you to the moon after. Well, right. if you if you want to know what a if you want to know what a 300 million mile journey is like, just try flying from O'Hare to LaGuardia today. <laughs> uh, you don't need to go to Mars. It'll be quicker going to Mars. Are we That's tied? two. We're it's tied. two. All that means it's sudden death. All right, so for the final. Final, Good luck to you. Final she's, she's crushing my hair. They're being yes. very sporting. She's just broken three of his fingers. He'll never have the strength to push that. But this is an amazing You've got turnaround. some Scottish in you, don't you? Uh, the this final yeah. question. Folks on social media are taking part in a holiday prank called the Turkey Challenge. Participants try to get a rise out of mom by texting her to ask if it's possible to cook a massive turkey in what unusual way? Oh! And it's... Tammy. This was on Fox and Tammy. Friends. In the microwave. Let's see. Cooking a turkey. That's too ridiculous. That you can't gave me, possibly you were be too right. good with your Roll instructions. Tape. Kids are sending their moms prank text messages asking how long they could cook. They should cook a 25-pound turkey <laughs> in the microwave. One mom responded, wrap it in foil, put it in the microwave, then go buy a...